Now, most of us in this room, I'm sure, have had the experience that runs something like this. You are having your devotions. You're reading the Bible. And now this passage, drawn from some book or other in the New Testament, cites or alludes to an Old Testament text. So you look it up. And you cannot, for the life of you, make sense of what the New Testament writer is doing with it. Now, am I the only one that that's happened to? I, I, I doubt it. Almost anybody who reads the Bible and flips back and forth a quotation has had this sort of experience. And you fumble around and you pray over it and think about it and conclude that this is something to ask your pastor someday. And if he doesn't know, then ask Dr. Meninger, what, what, what's, what's he here for in any case? You know, he, he needs to earn his money. And, and so ask, ask some professor at the seminary and, and you'll get the truth. Of course, after a while, you discover there are so many of these passages that it's a bit disconcerting. And, and for the serious Christian, it, it's not destabilizing. It's merely mystifying. You don't want to say something rude like, well, if I had written it, I wouldn't have put it that way. You're talking about God's holy word, after all. But there's a little corner down there somewhere in the back side of your mind where, quite frankly, you wish it had been a little clearer. Well, the experts tell us that the New Testament books, if they are rated according to the difficulties they present in their allusions to and quotations of the Old Testament, are ranked in severity along the following lines. The toughest two are Matthew and Hebrews. Well, I wrote a commentary on Matthew, and I've been teaching Hebrews and Greek for years and years and years, so I have been forced by the nature of my work to try to think through these questions again and again and again and again. And I have to tell you, quite frankly, I don't have all the answers. But Greg Beale and I then edited a book, a commentary on the use of the Old Testament by the New, in which we were forced to think through a lot of these issues. So I think I can safely say I understand more of them than I used to. Uh, but about many of them I'm still learning quite a lot. And I suspect that in glory, in resurrection bodies, we will still have the privilege of sorting through some of these things and seeing why God did it that way. And in these three talks, I want to focus on three such passages, all drawn from Hebrews, and the corresponding Old Testament passages to which they refer. Begin with the Son of God theme, which is introduced to us in the prologue, and in particular gives us the first quotation in Hebrews 1.5. Hebrews 1.5, which has two Old Testament quotations. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. From Psalm 2. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. From 2 Samuel 7, 14, parallel in 1 Chronicles 17. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the passage as a whole. You recall that most of chapter 1 is given over to insisting upon Jesus' superiority over the angels. One of the reasons why Jesus is judged superior to the angels is that the angels were not addressed by these words. The Son was addressed by these words. For to which of the angels did God ever say, Psalm 2, or again, 2 Samuel 7? In other words, just to stick with Psalm 2 for a moment, Psalm 2 is quoted in order to prove Jesus' intrinsic superiority over the angels. Is that clear? But this verse is quoted three times in the New Testament. The second one is found in Hebrews 5, 
verses 5 and 6. In the same way, in the same way by which Aaron did not take on the honor of high priesthood to himself but was appointed by God, in the same way Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, here's the quotation, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We'll come to Melchizedek in the second talk, third talk, whatever, one of those. My Greek's not bad, my counting leaves a little to be desired. So in this context then, the quotation from Psalm 2-7 is taken to demonstrate that Jesus did not take on the high priesthood of his own accord, but he was appointed by God. Is that clear? There's one more quotation in the New Testament that picks up on Psalm 2-7. It's found in Acts chapter 13, Paul's address in Pisidian Antioch. Begin at verse 32. We tell you the gospel, we tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Now the context will show that this raising up is not raising up to be a prophet or raising up to be the Messiah, but raising up from the dead. You can decide for yourself if I'm telling you the truth by just reading on a few verses. What God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. To sum up, this verse is simultaneously said to warrant Jesus' superiority over the angels, to demonstrate that he did not appoint himself as high priest, and three, that he was to rise from the dead. But when you look at Psalm 2 and read it carefully, you will discover that it does not say anything about angels. It does not say anything about the high priesthood of Jesus, the Messiah. And it doesn't mention the resurrection. What is going on? Now, we will begin not with Psalm 2, but with something which in redemptive history is antecedent to Psalm 2. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, to which I invite you to turn. This is the other verse that is quoted in Psalm 1. You are, I'm sure, familiar with 2 Samuel 7, one of the great seedbeds of messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. We're told that after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, tick that rest verse, that rest reference. We'll come back to it in the second talk tomorrow when we talk about rest and Sabbath rest in, in Hebrews 3 and 4. When the Lord had given David rest from all his enemies, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Nathan began by saying, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead. The Lord's with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan and God said to David through Nathan, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelled in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock. 
and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut all your enemies off from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest. There it is again, from all your enemies. So, even going so far, we can see that one of the points that God makes is that at all the great return, returning points in redemptive history, God takes the initiative. Consider Abraham. Did Abraham wake up one day and say, you know, I've been thinking about things, God, and I've got a suggestion to make. It's as if the world is going to hell in a handbasket. We should start over. I'll be the great granddaddy. You'll be our God. We'll start with a new covenant. Start all over. Don't you think that's a great idea? Is that what happened? God takes the initiative. When Moses tries to take the initiative as a young man, it didn't work out very well. But when Moses turned 80, God took the initiative again. At all the great turning points in redemptive history, God takes the initiative. So if the time has come for the echoes from Deuteronomy to work out in a temple, the timing, the plan will be God's. God takes the initiative. Did I tell you to do this? No. Did I tell any of the antecedent rulers to do this? No. So, 11b, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Now, clearly, there's a pun that's going on there. What David means by a house is a temple. What God is promising David is not so much a temple as a dynasty. I will build a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, in this case, that's virtually equivalent to meaning when you die, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Clearly, a temple in the context. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There it is. I will be his father and he will be my son. To whom is that referring? Of course, you will not quickly jump to the conclusion it refers to Jesus because of the next line. If you think it refers to Jesus, you've got some dangerous Christology under your belt. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. It cannot possibly, in the first instance, be referring to Jesus. Agreed? It's referring to Solomon. And the issue, at least in part, is what happens when one of David's offspring goes bad. David knows what happened to Saul. Saul started off well, but ended up pretty miserably. But God says, my love will never be taken away from him, this offspring who will be punished by me, but not destroyed by me. My love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Now the point is that 714, the crux of the promise here, is referring to a son who cannot in the first instance be Jesus. Jesus. 
But clearly, in our passage in Hebrews, the context shows there it is Jesus. So we are forced to raise questions about how Davidic typology works, how you leap from Solomon, about whom God says, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But the son to which to whom reference is made in Hebrews is the son whom Hebrews keeps insisting did no sin, did no evil. He was, in fact, morally perfect. How do you make the leap? David understood that in the first instance, this was a promise for a dynasty that will outstretch not only Saul's, but everyone else's. This is a dynasty which will see a forever throne. Verse 16, your throne will be established forever. And in the following verses, 18 and on, some of the most intense, moving praise found anywhere from the pen of David is bold on the page in front of us. I wish I had time to probe it with you. Now then, hang on to that for a moment and turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Here we find verse 7 quoted in Hebrews 1. But begin a little earlier. Psalm 2, 1, the psalmist writes, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his Meshiach, against his anointed, against his Messiah. But of course, by now, you know that Messiah is not always a technical term pointing to the Messiah. It just refers to the anointed one. And the context establishes who the anointed one is. Is this referring to Yahweh against the Lord and the Messiah? And people are rebelling against God and his anointed Messiah? Now, some argue that it is referring to the Lord Jesus as he comes to be known in the days of his flesh. Others see, again, a reference to the Davidic king. We'll read on. The enemies say, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles, which happened often enough historically in David's reign. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Then the voice changes. The psalmist gives his reflection. This is the decree, verse 6, of the Lord himself. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Verse 7, the king says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Now pause there it's time to start thinking a little more globally about sonship terminology in Scripture. Go back to Psalm to, to Isaiah 1 again just for a moment. We're told, if you recall, that the Son there is greater than the angels because the angels aren't called Son. Never? What about the book of Job? Angels are explicitly called sons. Even the Satan is called the son of God. So angels there, and occasionally in the Psalms, can be called son of God, sons of God. Moreover, a human being can be called the son of God just because he's a human being. Think of the genealogy of Adam in Luke 2. 
so-and-so is the son of so-and-so, who's the son of so-and-so, he's the son of so-and-so, to Adam, who is the son of God. So you don't have to be an angel to be designated son of God. You don't have to be an angel, a human being to be designated son of God, but you can be in the right context. Sometimes the godly under the old covenant and the godly under the new covenant are called sons of God too. So assuming that the writer to the Hebrews knows what he's doing, when he says that the son is the only one who's called the son and not angels, he is not saying that this is so by virtue of mere linguistic usage. The sonship is different from any other sonship, not that nobody else is called son. So here, what is the nature of the sonship? Let me um, try a little experiment with you. Start with the men. We have two or three women here. We'll do it with the women too, but the numbers are so low that I can't make the same statistical argument. But with the men, I think I can. How many of you men are doing now at your age, vocationally, what your fathers did at the same age? Let me see your hand. Three, maybe four. I will try for the women as well. How many of you women are doing now, at your age, what your mothers did at the same age? One. Well, that's 33%, not bad. <laughs> the, the point is that in our culture, there's no pressure or very little pressure to do vocationally what your parents did. In fact, there's a lot of incentive to do something different. No one says, my father was a farmer, so of course I was bound to become a farmer. If your father was a farmer and you decided to become a farmer, well, it's good for the farm, but it's your choice. Jesus, in the days of his flesh, was known as the carpenter, as well as in one place, the carpenter's son, as the carpenter's son, as well as in one place, he's actually called the carpenter in, in, in Mark chapter 6. There was an expectation that the, that the father's job as some sort of technical worker would get passed on and adopted by the son. That's the baker's son. That's the candle maker's son. That's the farmer's son. That's the farmer. Do you see? So sonship is bound up not just with DNA and with genes, but with heritage, with what you belong to, what you're characterized by. So here in this context, when God says, I have made this decree, and today you have become my son. Then, assuming this connection between vocation and sonship, when God on a certain day says, today you have become my son, he's really saying, today, in this context, you become king. God is the supreme king. And as my son, you reign in my name. What does the decree? I have installed my king. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. David responds. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Well, in one sense, because he's a human being, he's, David is God's son in one sense. In another sense, he begins his sonship when he takes on the kingship, which is enacted, effected, begun by God's decree. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Does the ends of the earth mean the farthest reaches on this planet? It could. Or does it mean the farthest corners of the land? It's Eretz. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the Eretz. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, that is the king. Or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. 
Now you can argue back and forth about whether the writer of this psalm has primarily the Davidic king in mind or the messianic king in mind. But at one point, of course, the Davidic king was the Messiah, the anointed one, by virtue of his post. Let me give you one more passage, which is actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 2 as well. This is Psalm 45. It, it, it raises the same sets of questions, but it makes something very clear. The introduction calls this a wedding psalm. And it is. The first verse is a kind of authorial reflection on what is going on in the psalm. There are several psalms that begin with introductions. 37, 1 to 3, 49, 1 to 4, where there's a kind of authorial meditation on what's going on. Here it's, my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Then in verses 2 to 5, the writer talks about the king's majesty and stature. You are most excellent of men. Your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty and so forth. Verses 6 to 9, the king's person and state are the focus of the poet's reflection. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. To whom is that addressed? Now clearly in verses 2 to 5, he's addressing the king. You are the most excellent of men. Your lips have been anointed with grace. God has blessed you. Gird your sword on your side. Clearly the human king. But in verse 6, is this addressed to a human king or to God himself? It has to be the human king. Read on where the text goes. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions. So if this is being addressed to God, how can the author said, therefore, God, your God, will do such and such? But if he's addressing the messianic king, then he can still address God. He can refer to God as distinct from the Messianic king. In verse 7, Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. But that means that the psalmist is addressing the Messianic king, the Messianic figure, as God. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And there's something deeply in the core of all of us confessional Christians that's a bit uncomfortable by that. We're told again and again and again that God cannot finally be compared with another. He is unique. There is but one God. But here, clearly, somebody's breaking the rules. Addressed clearly to the Messianic King, the psalmist says, Your throne... O oh God, is forever and ever. Now, there are half a dozen texts in the Old Testament that do something like this. Moses, for example, is said at one point to be like God, to be God, the text actually says, to be God for his people. That doesn't mean that this is making an ontological leap. Moses now becomes God, but... When he speaks God's words, he's speaking with the voice of God. You be God for us. Now most of us who preach and teach and read from Scripture do not claim to be God just because we're proclaiming God's words. But the Old Testament text can sometimes sidle up that far. And it's sidling up again here. Now hang on to that fact for a moment till we go a little farther. In verses 10 to 12, 
the poet addresses the bride's allegiance. Now it's becoming clear that we're dealing with a wedding. Listen, daughter, pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the, thrall, the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tyre, proverbial for wealth, will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. And then the wedding train is introduced. Verses 13, 14, 15. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. That's probably the, what it means. Her gown is interwoven with gold and embroidered garment. She is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her. Those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. The, the marriage is consummated. But it's the last two verses you must not forget. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. In other words, out of this union, children rise up. And your sons, addressed now to the king, it's no longer addressed to the wife, it's addressed to the king, your sons will take the place of your fathers. That's what happens in a royal wedding. You want the dynasty to be established. Yes, you, you, you want the marriage to be consummated for several reasons, presumably for love and for family ties and all kinds of things, but not least, when it's a royal wedding, for establishing the line. Now the wedding is consummated in verse 15. And the poet says to the king, your sons will take the place of your fathers. Notice, not be added to your fathers. Take the place of your fathers. The old generation dies off. And the sons which come out of the wedding are the new generation which replaces them. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will rise, will praise you forever and ever. Do you see my, the point? This is addressed to a human David-eyed king. Otherwise, you cannot make sense of the final two verses of the psalm. It's addressed to a Davidic king who is addressed as God. In verses 6 and 7. It's stretching common Old Testament usage pretty far, but you can make sense of it when you remember that Moses can be treated like God when he speaks God's words. Now the Davidic king can as well when he's ruling in God's name. That's picked up in Hebrews chapter 1, applied to Jesus, and say there, that demonstrates Jesus' intrinsic superiority. He's addressed as God. But clearly, whatever Psalm 45, 6 means, it is not trying to establish the intrinsic deity of a Davidic king. He's God's son because he is standing in the place of God, operating as God's messenger, as God's king, as, as, as God's royal figure. But it's not talking about ontology. It's talking about the effluent of Davidic rule. And that is surely what's going on likewise in Psalm 2. Now then, where does that take us? Come back to Hebrews 1 once again. What is the nature of the superiority that is being affirmed in verses 5 to 14. You, you see, when you and I start talking about how Jesus is superior to angels, because of where we stand in the Western history of thought, we automatically tend to gravitate toward ontology, toward level of being. Angels can't be as great as God. The Son of God, in that sense, can't be. So there's no difficulty in affirming that the Son of God is greater than angelic figures. But when you read through these quotations from the Old Testament, what you discover is that either all of them or most of them are not so much focusing on ontology as on function. Verse 
That was clear in Psalm 45. When the king is addressed as God, he's not being addressed as ontologically unique. He's being addressed as the one who has the status of God because of his kingship. He's been appointed king. He's been declared king. Same with Psalm 2. The Lord has installed his king on his holy hill. He has declared him to be the king. The son figure in Hebrews chapter 2 is first of all superior to the angels because only the son king has the kingly rights of God. He reigns. It's the kingship theme. Now, clearly, that has some implications for ontology that you can think about, but the focus is not ontology. It's on function as king by God's own decree. But to make things still more interesting, more complicated, now return to the prologue, the preface. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I'm sure as many of you have been drawn to this text in the Greek text. He has spoken unto us en huio, not en to huio, by the son, but en huio. At the risk of a paraphrastic rendering, it means something like this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in sonship revelation. He has spoken unto us in sonship categories. The emphasis is on the nature of the thing rather than the individual identity of the thing. Whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Well, now there's no confusion with the Davidic king. There's no Davidic king through whom God made the universe. Save great David's greater son who comes long after David himself is dead and buried. Here is a son who is heir of all things through whom also he made the universe. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. We might almost say he's the shining of the shining. God's glory is manifested. And the sun is the radiance of that glory. He's the shining of the shining. You look at that shining and you see the sun. You look at that shining and you see God. So here is a use of sonship language which outstrips the limitations of David designation, but it's plopped down in the introduction before you get to verses 5 and following. This son, who is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustains all things by his powerful word. He's God's mediating authority. After he had provided purification for sins, if there were any doubt about who the referent is before, there can be none now. There is no other son who provided purification for sins by his own death. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. If I understand the logic of verse 4, this is disputed, but I think that it's correct. He became as much superior to the angels as his superiority was already established by his being, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. The name he has inherited is sonship. But it's not just sonship because that's a label that can be thrown around. But in the context of the Davidic king, 
He alone is the son par excellence who bears the Davidic nomenclature that leads ultimately to great David's greater son. So if you ask, well then, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, who then is the son? Is it the eternal son, the manifestation of God's glory, the effulgence of his radiance, the shining of his shining? the one who is God's co-creator, who made all things by his powerful, who upholds all things by his powerful word? Or is it the Davidic king who comes in David's line, great David's greater great-grandson? And the answer, of course, is yes. He's both. Sonship language can be used both ways. But to demonstrate that this Son is greater than the angels. It's predicated not simply on his status with God and creation, not simply with his status as the effulgence of God's glory, but it's established by reference to his role as great David's greater son. Only that Davidic king has the authority, the sweep, the assignment, the role to be God's own spokesperson, God's voice, to be rightly addressed as God, to be rightly addressed as God by God. And thus the fulfillment of the Old Testament text to demonstrate that he is superior to the angels is bound up with the assumption of a pretty common Davidic typology which pulsates through the New Testament again and again and again. What is presupposed is that some of these structures, some of these themes, some of these people are not only pegs in the Old Testament narrative, pegs in redemptive history, but markers which themselves point forward, themselves anticipate the future which themselves are prophetic, predictive. It's not only words that are predictive, but jobs, callings, institutions, people, which can be predictive. And thus in addressing the one, those with eyes to see can understand how the future is being addressed as well. Well, that's one of the uses of sonship that is at least unpacked a little. When we read, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son today, I become your father. I will be his father and he will be my son. That is not simply claiming that Jesus alone is called son, because that's not true. Others are called son too. But to which angel did God ever make this decree of kingship, this decree of establishing a unique relationship between the father and the son? No angel ever had that authority. No angel ever carry that sweep of acknowledgement. To no angel did God ever say, you are my son, and address him as God, as in Psalm 45. Now what about the second instance? The instance in Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 5 and 6. You recall that this passage is affirming that Jesus did not take upon himself the authority to become the high priest. He was appointed by God. So the sonship language is not only God's decree bound up with the establishment of Jesus' king dominion, but bound up with the establishment of his role as priest. How do you get that? I think that the problem we have in understanding what is going on here is that for the last oh, 100, 150 years or so, we have been thought, taught to think of Christology in remarkably bitty ways. There are New Adam Christologies, there are Davidic Kingship Christologies, there are Priesthood Christologies, there are Melchizedekian Christologies and so on. And they're all thought to reflect different communities and different heritages and different cycles in the life of the church and so on. Many is the book on Christology in the library here where that is the approach taken by scholars who are not cast in the confessional line that is characteristic of this school. 
But no matter how sympathetic I try to be to this perspective, the less credible I find it. Can you really imagine some Christian in Antioch saying, well, I know that some people have a Melchizedekian Christology, but for me, I'm a Davidic Christology kind of guy. <laughs> That's my denominational label. Can, can you imagine it? Th these things are tied together by first century Christians. They're, they're looking to see how they're held together, how they reinforce each other. So if by God's decree, by which he announces, you are my son, by which he announces his Davidic role as the king of kings, God's own spokesperson, then does he not also, by the same token, announce him to be God's servant in his call to be a savior and to be a sacrifice, God's call to be a priest, God's call to be the mediator, God's call to provide the atoning sacrifice that has already been introduced in the prologue? I think that connection is simply assumed by first century Christians. You don't have to prove it. It's already assumed. God appointed Jesus to be the sacrifice. God appointed Jesus to be the king. God appointed Jesus to be the priest. God appointed Jesus to be the promised heir. God appointed Jesus again and again. And it's not that God did one and then the other and then three months later did something else. This is the nature of the appointment, God's appointment of Jesus as priest king, which is a theme that will be dealt with in greater detail when we come to Melchizedek tomorrow afternoon or late morning or whatever the schedule is. So then suddenly the use of Psalm 2 in Hebrews 5 has a certain sense to it, a certain logicality. What about the use in Acts chapter 13, the last one? There, if you recall, the you are my son language, is bound up with Jesus' resurrection. Well, to see how that works out, remind yourself of something that you have all thought about at one time or another, I'm sure. When does Jesus' role as king begin? Now, I'm not talking about the eternal son, but the human God-man Jesus Christ. When does his role begin as king? When does he assume his kingship? That is surprisingly difficult to answer. In one sense, he's born a king. The Magi saw that, whereas he was born king of the Jews. In another sense, his, he enters into his kingly roles when he, he begins with his miracles of healing and, and even revivication and, and casting out the demons, the the signs and powers of the kingdom are already demonstrated in the life and ministry of Jesus. In, in yet another sense, he reigns from the cross. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And he exercises a certain kingly authority even in the cross. In yet another sense, and this is the dominant one in the New Testament, he enters into his kingly role as he rises from the dead and ascends to the Father's right hand. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So, if we're focusing on the time when God proclaims the decree which anoints Jesus as the promised messianic king figure, then that's when the kingdom begins. And different writers can use that theme in different ways and acknowledge that there are different ways of looking at when it begins. But dominantly in the New Testament, that is a resurrection function. Jesus rises from the dead. Death dies. The king reigns. <laughs>
And thus the resurrection of Jesus in Acts 13 is seen to be the fulfillment of Psalm 2. There is far more integrated Christological thinking in the New Testament documents than we imagine in our bifurcated and bitty modes of theological analysis in the Western world. Well, so much for the King passage. Tomorrow we'll look at chapters four and five, uh, th three and four, and consider the rest passages, and then eventually we'll get to Melchizedek.